In the case of, say, the alpine tree frog and the Buralong frog, those reintroductions have primarily been for experimental purposes. Um, but for the other species, the southern crabberry frog, northern crabberry frog, yellow spotted bell frog, and spotted tree frog, those the reintroductions, which um, which are actually ongoing at the moment, are undertaken specifically as a recovery action to assist to directly assist the conservation of those species. So, look, I just want to I'm just I'm just going to outline a, a few things associated with. Um, our, some of our reintroductions, which I guess seem pretty obvious, but I think they are kind of in, important points with regards to reintroductions where the chytrid fungus is the key threat. And so, so just by the way, um, I'm, I'm sure everyone here probably knows this, but when I say chytrid fungus or BD, I'm referring to the same thing, but I'm, I'm sure everyone's aware of that. Um, so look, I just want to make an important point about reintroductions where chytrid is the key threat. Um, and this is partly because of what I'm often faced with from, well, often people who are sort of outside the, the threatened frog game. But, um, you know, I'm often, often um, you know, I receive the comment that reintroductions, you know, shouldn't really go ahead unless unless the, the key threat has either been significantly reduced or mitigated um, because of the obvious implication that without significantly reducing the key threat um, your your prospects for success with the reintroduction are, are likely to be very low um, the real problem here with regards to reintroductions where the chytrid fungus is the key threat is that currently we have very limited or no capacity to directly mitigate BD. So we have, we have very limited or no capacity to, to, uh, to enhance the, you know, the immune response of, of um, frogs or you know, amphibians um, to BD infection, and we have very limited capacity to remove BD from the environment. Um, so with regards to this, um, you know, in some respects, compared to the more traditional ideas about how reintroductions are undertaken, we do need to consider reintroductions in a in somewhat of a different light. And in one, in, in, in particular, we need to consider them often as a as a sort of ongoing integrated component of the broader recovery program. And I'll get into a bit more detail about this later. Um, and I also think it's important to set realistic objectives associated with reintroductions where chytrid's the key threat. So by way of example, a very simple example, an unrealistic objective would probably be that we're gonna go about undertaking a reintroduction with the expectation that, that we would, you know, straight up establish a self-sustaining population. Potentially a more realistic objective for your reintroduction program is that, that you hope to use reintroductions to maintain the species in the wild. In the absence of the reintroductions, the species would probably be extinct. Um, and so just thinking about that, where do our reintroductions fit into our, our sort of threatened frog management in this part of the world? So this is just a general framework, um, you know, outlining the sort of knowledge progression associated with our reintroduction programs. You know, so we have a species we're concerned about, we determine its distribution, we determine important populations, management units, often through genetic techniques. Um, we gain an understanding of its population trajectory through monitoring, or in some cases, just because it's bleedingly obvious, there's so few left. Um, you know, and if, there, if the species is in an ongoing state of decline, if we know that the threat is primarily due to um, the chytrid fungus, then we go about establishing a captive assurance colony, and that really is, a fundamentally important objective because without that we lose the species altogether um, and then following on from that we then start attempting to develop effective reintroduction techniques. Um, the other side of that is that there are other manageable threats associated with the species conservation that we can um, pursue and, and hopefully result in, in assisting the recovery of the species. So the species there on the left are the ones where we're faced with captive assurance colonies, otherwise we're going to lose, lose either the, the species as a whole or important populations. The species on the right are the ones where um, we don't have to go down that 
more intensive path of captive assurance colonies and reintroductions. So, you know, while I make the point, so I'm just going to focus on the southern crabbery frog at this point. So while I make the point that, um, you know, we, we're currently limited in terms of directly mitigating the chytrid fungus, um, as I'm sure all of you are aware, there's, there's lots of scope to, to think about ways in which we can indirectly mitigate the chytrid fungus. And, and so we all know that, that um, there are different factors that can influence uh, the level of susceptibility at the population level of a species that's susceptible to the chytrid fungus. And this inclo includes, you know, um, environmental factors such as, as the temperature of microclimates um, or the water chemistry, pH and salinity has, has been shown to influence um, levels of, of infection rates and susceptibility. But then you've got other biotic sort of factors, whether it be you know, demographic factors such as compensatory recruitment um, or things like other, other reservoir hosts in the environment that are basically facilitating infection in your susceptible species. And so th this is where um, you, you start really thinking hard about how can I use information about what are the external factors um, influencing the susceptibility of your, of your species to think about how you can maximize the, the success of your reintroductions. And so in the case of our Southern Corroboree frog, what we know about this species is that the key factor influencing population level susceptibility is the pr presence of a highly abundant um, reservoir host species in another frog species being the common eastern froglet. And so this, this common eastern froglet occurs in high abundance throughout the Southern Corroboree frog's former range and pretty much every single common eastern froglet is carrying the chytrid fungus. And, you know, and we know that the role of reservoir hosts is um, a pretty common feature in the, the sort of um, uh, the, 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 the epidemi epidemiology of susceptible frog species. And so, you know, a great example for, for this relationship with the crabberry frogs um, is with the northern crabberry frog. So one of Ben Shields' uh, PhD chapters demonstrated that um, in one part of the landscape where the northern crabberry frog ha happens to be existing without the common eastern froglet, it's doing much better. Everywhere else, the northern crabberry frog co-occurs with the common eastern froglet and it's in real trouble. Um, luckily for us, there's a part of its, its range where the common eastern froglet doesn't occur and thankfully, um, you know, the, the end result is the northern crabberry frog in that part of the range is doing much better. So, so in terms of coming back to our southern crabberry frog and how we use that information to, to think about our reintroductions for that species, um, you know, we start to think about, well, how can we, how can we, um, uh, you know, dissociate interactions with the common eastern froglet um, when we do our southern crabberry frog reintroductions. And so this is something that we're currently in the process of developing. Um, and it is a very slow process. This, this frog um, has a generation time of about seven to eight years. And, so, and because you want multiple generations, it takes about 10 years to just um, test one possible method. Um, and, and so at the, at the moment, we're sort of, um, you know, spreading our net quite broad and we're testing four different tech reintroduction techniques where we're specifically trying to um, dissociate the southern crabberry frog from the common eastern froglet. And so one of the techniques is reintroducing within the historic range and that's releasing into artificial ponds um, that the common eastern froglet can't access. But then in addition to that, we're trialing a bunch of techniques um, in different parts of the landscape or, or created landscapes um, where the common eastern froglet doesn't occur. And this includes releasing into large enclosures, releasing into small enclosures, and then also releasing into artificial habitats that we're creating. So just go through some of these. Um, here's some artificial ponds that we're releasing the, the southern crabberry frog into, and so these so by having these little artificial ponds um, positioned in the landscape, 
and slightly raised from the ground, the common eastern froglet can't access them. So, that, so we know when the uh, southern crowbarry frog tadpoles metamorphose and the metamorphs come out, they come out um, without BD infection, without chytrid infection, and we also get greater survivorship in those artificial ponds than, than, than occurs in the natural um, ponds. And so we've actually, this is one of the first techniques we've, we started trialling. And what we've shown with this is that um, this technique is actually effective at maintaining southern crawberry frogs in the wild, um, albeit that our return rates aren't that great. Um, but nevertheless, we can use this technique to keep southern crawberry frogs in the wild, which to some degree is actually achieving our reintroduction objective for that species. Uh, we have actually also trialled reintroduction, reintroducing adults. Um, the idea being that uh, if you've if you've you know reared the animal through to a late frog stage, in, in in this case an adult stage, that you're bypassing those various life history stages where the species might bump into the common eastern froglet and become infected with the pathogen. And and again, we do get some returns, and we could potentially use that technique to maintain the species in the wild but it is much more expensive because you've, you're rearing animals for a long period of time and we're initially interested in this technique um, in the hope that well maybe if our return rates are high enough we could potentially use the technique to release harvest breeding in the wild then rear and then re-release as a way of maintaining populations without having to undergo the actual captive breeding process in captivity because that's the captive breeding process is a is a um, procedure that requires you know a lot of intensive resource resources and so we're looking at this release stage purely as a potentially um, efficient way to go about the program but what we found was at least in that initial trial was that our return rates aren't really sufficient to bypass the need for captive breeding so um, you know this is just a bit of modeling we needed about 15% return rates to achieve that stable or increasing population just with um, rearing and release, um, but we're not quite getting that. And so, you know, we only got a, received about 7% return rates. And so um, we're best off maintaining our captive breeding and going back to um, pursuing different techniques involving the release of eggs, as that's a very cheap and efficient way to do the releases. So the other thing that we're in the process of developing is actually creating um, uh, an environment for the crabby frog um, where, where there is no common eastern froglet and creating it in a, in a fenced off area so no other frog species can actually enter the environment um, and infect the crabby frogs. And this has been a, um, the, you know, the, the, the results thus far are, are very promising. We've had all life history stages run through the enclosures um, uh, from, tap, from egg through to sexual maturity and breeding. Um, and we've had, well, in the large enclosures, no infection with the amphibian chytrid fungus. We, we're not quite getting the survivorship that we really want at this stage, but that's just, we just view that as, you know, a matter of tweaking the, the system. Um, but at this stage, the results are very promising and, and, um, and potentially, um, you know, an extremely efficient way of going about these sort of programs um, into the future, uh, given that, you know, you know, really the, the level of resourcing, you know, for anyone who's undertaken um, captive, you know, the, the implementation of captive assurance colonies, you know just how resource intensive these programs are. To have Mother Nature doing that in a, in a sort of robust, productive field enclosure it is potentially a very efficient way of going about this sort of work, not to mention all the other potential benefits, which I'll touch on a bit later. Um, so in addition to that, we're also trialling um, establishing the frog in, in small ring enclosures um, which is which are kind of just a smaller version of the large enclosures, but the potential benefits are that you know you have greater replication, you're spreading your risk, 
and you know you have potentially have greater capacity to use the enclosures for experimental purposes because you have that sort of replication. Um, uh, you know, again, there's some promising results with the ring enclosures, but um, we're not getting the survivorship we want at this stage, and so you know more work to be done there. But um, yeah, it's, it, from my, I'm still feeling very positive about it. The, the initial signs are very positive. So one, one little comment I made earlier, um, which I think is a very important aspect of thinking about um, your reintroduction programs, is not that, that so much that there are, hey, we have this recovery action that we're gonna implement and then hopefully move on, but rather at least in the, 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 um, this, current, this current period of having limited capacity to manage the chytrid fungus, that reintroductions are com considered very much an integrated component and on in integrated and ongoing component of your recovery program. Um, and so, you know, it is almost just like an extension of your captive assurance colony. And so, um, you know, this is kind of a schematic diagram of our broader, um, you know, of our, our broader recovery program for the, say, the southern corroboree frog and the wild populations and the the um, uh, enclosure populations, we, we in the longer term want to have totally integrated with our captive colonies in terms of thinking about them as a, a way of, you know, maintaining field fitness and maintaining um, the captive, you know, maintaining maintenance of genetic, you know, important genetic variation into the future until such time as we have better capa capacity to manage the fungus. Um, and so, you know, as I just said, we're thinking about how these enclosures and the field reintroductions are actually totally integrated with the assurance colonies. So, so just want to um, move on and sort of talk about our spotted tree frog example, um, uh, because it's a, it's a different sort of case in terms of our strategies for the reintroductions. Um, but for in New South Wales, without the captive breeding and the reintroductions, um, the spotted tree frog would essentially be extinct. And so initially, um, what we tried to do was re-establish the spotted tree frogs back in a site where they were historically known to occur. And our, our thinking being that, well, um, other spotted tree frogs in a, in a neighbouring state are persisting, albeit at very low numbers. So our, the thinking was that if we establish the spotted tree frog in relatively low numbers, maybe um, as opposed to it was historically in very high abundance, there was an outbreak of chytrid and the site declined to pretty much nothing. Um, if we re-establish it from low, a lower base, maybe the dynamics will be such that the, the species will persist at low abundance like what we see elsewhere in, in the neighbouring state. Um, in addition to that, um, we we're using individuals for the captive breeding program from populations that had been exposed to the chytrid fungus for a number of years. So we're also hopeful that maybe there had been some level of, of um, you know, rapid evolution for a more robust immune response and, and individuals from that program might have, have um, greater capacity to survive a level of chytrid infection. Um, so we, we undertook our captive breeding at the Amphibian Research Centre, built up numbers and then um, reintroduced and, and things were looking okay. Started, you know, numbers were breeding up, had reasonable survivorship, breeding commenced in the wild, but then we, we um, had subsequent uh, chytrid fungus outbreaks and very rapid decline back to pretty much nothing in the wild. And so that was pretty much told us that... Um, uh, you know, as it currently stands, the, the spotted tree frog in New South Wales can't really persist in um, sites where it um, previously occurred. So we then started thinking about, well, you know, should we start thinking about um, uh, assisted colonisation to potentially other sites? And one of the obvious sort of things we were looking for um, which has been um, put out there in the literature quite a bit by people like Robert Pushendorf and so forth, 
was the idea that let's let's look for a new site that has potentially much warmer microclimates um, where the spotted tree frog might be able to then persist uh, and avoid um, you know too much chytrid infection and so the the temperature traces on the left there um, are just showing temperature traces for an example for for you know a representative microhabitat site that the spotted tree frog would use and so Bogon Creek at the top there is um, where the species historically occurred and the new site is the temperature trace down the bottom. That red line on those temperature traces is that sort of you know critical 28, 29 degrees for BD as you can see. The, the Bogon Creek site um, in the representative microhabitat very rarely if ever got above that critical you know not good for BD temperature, whereas the new site had much warmer microclimates. And um, so we undertook our releases um, into the new site and also into the, the um, Burke's Gorge historic site as a control. And what we found was that um, our spotted tree frogs have had much greater survivorship at the new site and have subsequently um, started uh, re, you know, reproducing and what this, what this graph, this graph shows you just the survivorship of the animals that were released. Um, and so our Burke's Gorge site, the orange line there on the bottom, they pretty much declined back to, to zero as, as it had occurred previously. Whereas with the new site, that blue line, we've had extremely high survivorship of the animals, animals we've released. But what that, that graph doesn't show is that those released animals have subsequently, um, bred quite a, quite a lot and the population is now um, well and truly exceeding the number of animals that were re initially released. So, so far, um, at this stage at least, the reintroduction to a new site that um, at least our predictions based on the thermal properties of that new site um, uh, have, have proven to be very successful. Um, one little thing about this new site, which may also be a very important factor, is that there's no other riverine frogs at the new site. And so at this stage, we actually haven't detected any, any chytrid fungus infection. Um, and so the extent to which the, the success of the new site is due to the thermal properties of the site as opposed to the lack of any reservoir hosts is something that we're not entirely sure at this point in time. But um, anyway, I'm sure we'll find out in the future. Um, hopefully we won't all of a sudden have an outbreak and completely lose the new site, but time will tell. Um, so in terms of thinking about, well, where else can we put spotted tree frogs? Um, we've gone looking for other sites that may also have, you know, um, what we perceive as suitable um, thermal properties. And we have another, we have another couple of potential um, candidate sites for releasing spotted tree frogs. And so, you know, being in the Southern Hemisphere, uh, north and northwest um, aspect streams uh, are the warmer aspect streams. And so we've gone looking for new sites. So our new site there is a northwest aspect stream. We found another couple of potential candidate sites, Faint Creek and the Gubragandra River, that also have that same sort of microhabitat and north, north to northwesterly aspect. And the graph there is just showing the temperature traces of, of these potential candidate sites um, where we can see you know the, the potential new sites in yellow and red there also possess those really warm qualities that, that um, hopefully will will help spotted tree frogs persist. The, the interesting thing about these potential new sites though is that they also have another frog species the Burlong frog which is that frog you can see down on the bottom there and our screening of that frog has shown that it does carry quite significant amphibian chytrid fungus infection. And so these are, so releases into these potential new sites will be interesting because um, we know that there's a potential reservoir species that's carrying chytrid. So how that impacts our reintroduction efforts will be, we'll, um, we'll only find out until we try. So yeah, hopefully in a year or two, um, the Amphibian Research Centre We'll breed up some spotted tree frogs and we'll get to trial reintroductions into these new sites. And so just finally, I just want to acknowledge our key partners with these reintroductions. You know, obviously the work we're doing is 
focused around the field component, but it's none of it would be possible without the, you know, exhaustive sort of work being undertaken at the husbandry institution, Faronga Zoo, Zoo Victoria, and the Amphibian Research Centre, who are really they're the, the crux of these recovery programs and, and providing opportunities to actually pursue these reintroductions. So that's that's my presentation. Thanks. Um, so obviously what I want to do today is talk a bit about the genetic aspects of reintroductions. And um, I'm assuming this is a little bit foreign to some people here. <clears throat> I should just start by saying that I've never worked in amphibians in my life, but I have worked in a range of organisms in the translocation space that go all the way from eucalypts to mammals and grasshoppers, so quite a range of species. So if you look at the current IUCN guidelines for reintroductions and the conservation, um, there's no mention really of genetics in the main ones. I mean, this is starting to change a little bit, but a lot of the key documents you will download from the IOCN and also from other organizations doesn't really mention genetics very much at all. So typically, of course, you have one of these types of decision frameworks and those frameworks um, don't really mention genetics and they also don't mention evolution. Um, so it's kind of interesting that that particular um, area seems to be totally left out. So hopefully by the end of this talk, I can convince you that it really is worth considering it and um, considering it up front. So I suppose that's one of the things I want to try and get across. So if you're going to do this sort of work, you should really start thinking about genetics now rather than later. So start early and then you never know what you'll find, but it'll be very useful for you thinking forward um, in terms of these sorts of projects. So I'm going to try and illustrate that with some of the examples that I've been involved with and they will be quite far ranging. So, you know, the obvious point that we're facing, of course, and this is nothing new to you guys, is that, you know, basically we're facing the clients or the populations, and that applies to non-amphibians as much as to amphibians. And of course, you know, we do have these translocation frameworks that are being used for decision making as we speak. And, you know, that last point on that slide is really the important one, that, you know, it doesn't really explicitly consider plasticity, genetics and evolution. And it's worth just thinking about those three terms. So plasticity is the extent to which you can modify an organism um, due to the environmental exposure of that organism, and that connects within or between a generation. So it's the case certainly that in some organisms, what you're exposed to in one generation affects what you offspring, the phenotype that your offspring have. So your offspring might be more resistant to climate, they might be less resistant to climate. So there can be positive as well as negative effects, but it's very critical to consider those. And plasticity also encompasses what happens within a generation. So, you know, the early stages, the early life stages of an organism, of course, can be affected by environmental stress. And that will, in many cases, dictate how resistant the adults are to that stress. So it acts within generations as well as between generations. However, by the time you get to more than two generations, then it's really genetics that takes over. So the effects that are maternal inherited across one generation no longer important. And then it's all about changing your DNA, changing the allele frequencies in your populations, and as a consequence, getting adaptation through those genetic changes. And of course, the outcome from those processes is evolution. And, you know, one of the things that I always tell ecologists when I talk to them is that evolution can be very quick. <laughs> and um, some people have a bit of trouble with that notion, you know, they think the evolution occurs on a time scale of thousands or millions of years. But you can go from being susceptible to an environmental stress, for instance, to being resistance to that stress very, very quickly in just a few generations. If selection is strong enough, you'll generally get some sort of change happening. 
and you know you can produce an organism through a combination of plasticity and genetics over three or four generations and might be susceptible to a disease and then completely resistant to a disease so these sorts of changes can happen very very quickly within a species and as long as the selection is strong enough and the variation is there in the first place then that can happen so it's always worth keeping that in mind because we'll come back to this later because it really what means that you have to sort of always think carefully about how you maximize that potential how you maximize your ability of your population to actually undergo those changes and you know translocation is an incredibly powerful tool where we can increase this capacity quite markedly so obviously what you need to do is to think about well from a genetic perspective what are the options here what can i do what can I translocate? What's the best thing to translocate in order to capture that potential? How can I actually do that? And the first thing you really have to do is to think about a background genetic study. And I would argue that if you're considering a translocation, um, then it's always worth considering a background study of this type. And these days, these sorts of background studies are much cheaper because you know genetics has become very cheap. It's very easy to get some information about genetic markers and your populations. It's easy to look at genetic structure across populations using approaches that can really be followed through for a few thousand dollars. You need some expertise, of course, but you know there's plenty of expertise again available in university departments and government departments these days to implement these sorts of procedures. So you know I would argue that if you're thinking about translocation then you should always do some genetics to start off with because it's going to give you lots of useful information that is going to be able to guide your translocation quite effectively and you know what we typically do these days of course is we can use non-destructive methods to get our dna so we can get it from scales we can get it from hairs you know we can even get it from scats so there are ways of non-destructively sampling most organisms that might be of concern to you and typically in the old days we used to use mitochondrial dna a lot but these days we are switching to nuclear dna and um, the classic form of nuclear dna in the past for ecological type studies molecular ecology type studies have been microsatellites but you know we are starting to move away from that pretty rapidly um, to work towards SNPs. so SNPs are single nucleotide polymorphisms and typically what you do is you sample those from a small part of the genome. You might sequence 1% of the genome, for instance, and you identify these SNPs. But what it allows you to do is to get thousands of genetic markers. So instead of scoring a few genetic markers, a few tens of genetic markers, all of a sudden you're in the game by scoring thousands of these things. So typically an approach you have any organism where we're looking at population um, assessments, we will score 5,000 markers or more in those populations using SNPs. And the beauty of SNPs these days is that you don't need to know anything about the genome. You don't have to have a sequenced genome that you're comparing um, in order to do this sort of approach. So all you need is a bit of tissue, you need to extract the tissue, you then need to be able to get that DNA out, and you need to be able to identify SNPs from the DNA, and there's a number of techniques available. And what you then do is you will end up with a massive amounts of data. And of course, what you have to do is validate that data properly. But you know, if someone's holding your hand, that's certainly possible. And you then, of course, need a reasonable amount of computer power to analyze that data. And you need somebody who knows a bit about bioinformatics. But you know, students these days are very well versed in these sorts of things. So again, that's not a challenge in most situations. And the tendency is starting to be also to go towards whole genome resequencing. So this is sort of the next level that you're starting to see popping up in ecological studies as well. So instead of scoring thousands of SNPs, if you've got a genome available, then you can basically take that individual and sequence that individual and compare it to your genome that's already available. So we call that a resequencing approach. And that's starting to take off. And then of course, you know, instead of looking at thousands of SNPs, you might be looking at tens of thousands of SNPs 
and it also allows you to score deletions in the DNA and insertions in the DNA quite accurately as well. And those sorts of insertions and deletions can be involved in locking out genes, and that can be incredibly important in terms of adaptation. So we've gone from, my, from mitochondrial DNA to microsatellites to SNPs. SNPs are usually perfectly adequate for most translocation exercises. Even microsatellites can provide a lot of information. But these days you can also go to whole genome resequencing and actually understand the adaptive processes that might be going on in your population. And if you're trying to monitor your population directly in the future, that can actually be quite interesting and quite important. So what I want to do is to give you a simple example and this is actually a market satellites, not with SNPs. But a simple example of um, the sort of studies that we've been involved with um, in terms of the types of data you can collect and why it's actually useful. So this species of fish is called the dwarf galaxin. So it occurs in fresh water bodies in the states of Australia where I live in Victoria, and it's considered to be a threatened species. So it's a species that's of conservation concern. Excuse me. <clears throat> now in this particular case, you can non-destructively sample the species by taking fin clips. So you get a bit of tissue out of the fins and that then is adequate to extract DNA. So a very small amount of tissue in the fins of the small fish is enough to do DNA work. So this is the distribution of the species in the states that's I live in in Victoria and there are also a few populations on the left of that slide which is South Australia there's also a few populations in Tasmania and the Boston and there's also one on Ireland that falls between those two areas so this is not the total distribution of the species but this sort of gives you an indication of how wide the distribution is and each one of those red dots is one of our sampling points so what we've done is we've gone along we've sampled the fish and we've taken non-destructive samples, fin samples, from this particular fish species. So we have a pretty good representation of the distribution of that species by taking these samples. And of course, you know, in some cases you might only have three populations for your species. In other cases you might have more than this. You just need to get a good representation of the populations of your species that, you know, occur in the region that you're interested in. So that's sort of the first step. And you need to, of course, make sure that you then um, effectively analyze the data. And, you know, I'm not going to go into that because it would take me a few hours. But in this particular case, what we did was we collected microsatellites from the species. We then scored those microsatellites on a large number of individuals from each of those populations based on that non destructive sampling. And we then asked, you know, how different are these populations? So is it the case that a population, say here, is very different to one here? What about these populations here compared to these populations here? How different are they? And that gives us a level of indication of how isolated these populations are. So is it the case, for instance, that this population here is somehow connected to this one here? Or is it the case that these populations um, are quite isolated from each other and despite the fact that they are in the same catchments or the same waterway, they don't exchange genes very readily. So, you know, that's obviously a key question in translocation as well. So you can sort of see how this information starts to become useful. So in terms of genetic approaches, we tend to, we tend to illustrate these sorts of patterns with two types of approaches. So one is a Bayesian program called Structure that's become very popular. And what structure does is it gives you an indication of how isolated these populations actually are. And you take that microsatellite data, you run it through one of these structure programs, and you ask the question, well, is this population BCT connected or isolated from this population BC? And where the, the individuals in this population have the same color, that means that they could potentially come from exactly the same population. So you can see that this yellow color is applied to all of these three populations. So all of a sudden, just based on that genetic data, we know that these populations are highly interconnected with each other, but they are not connected to all the other populations that you can see here. 
So these populations are exchanging genes, which means they're obviously connected from a breeding point of view. These ones are exchanging genes. All these colors that are joined together are clearly cases where these populations are exchanging genes and exchanging individuals. So we know there's migration occurring very freely between those populations with the same color. On the other hand, we also get isolated populations. So if you look at MC, it really doesn't share genes with any of those other populations. It's quite unique. So that's a unique, a genetically unique population that is quite isolated from all the other populations. So immediately using this very simple approach, you get a very clear picture of what's actually happening with these populations in terms of exchange. Now you can also put this in space and you, know, you can do 3D plots or 2D plots using some, you know, you can use a scrimmage analysis or a principal components analysis. There's a few available. And this allows you to give some indication of how connected these populations are in space by using this different approach. And if we take all these dwarf galaxy populations, these fish populations, and this is what it looks like, we get a huge genetic distance between this group here and this particular group here. So this is the, the factor that accounts for most of the variation in your principal components analysis. And you can see that these are very discrete from these ones here. There's also some isolation between this population and these populations here, but it's not as strong as this distance here. So we have a west group in this particular species and we have an east group. And you know that immediately says to us, hey, there's something interesting going on here. There is a lot of isolation here between two groups that you can see very clearly just based on these microsatellite markers that we scored. And you know, another way of representing that that people commonly use is you can set up a little tree. So here's a sorry, I'll just go to this tree first. You can set up a little tree, and the tree looks a bit like this. So this is our west population, sorry, our east population here. So this is Gippsland, which is on the east of Victoria. And these populations all come together on our tree. So if you follow this branch of the tree, you can see that they're all connected to the same branch here. On the other hand, the western populations are these ones here, and you can see that they are actually connected to a totally different branch. So these ones are connected to this branch here, these ones are connected to this branch here. These are other species that we just thrown in the mix to help along, to help discriminate between these. But we clearly have two very different pools genetically of this fish species. And, and immediately you say, aha, there's something interesting going on here. And of course, this then taxonomically led to the realization that we had two species and not one species. So all of a sudden we were faced with not one threatened species, but two threatened species of this particular group. And you know, and typically when you do these sorts of genetic analyses, and it doesn't matter if you're talking about birds or fish or insects, you get surprises. You know, these sorts of analyses often lead to the identification of cryptic species that morphologically have looked absolutely identical. The other thing to note here is that you can see this Tasmanian population falls in this particular eastern region. So despite the fact that you've got this, this massive water body separating these two states, they seem to be quite closely related to one another. So that's information you get out of genetics. It doesn't take complicated genetics to get that sort of information. It often leads to what you don't expect to happen. Now, the other thing you'll get out of this genetic information is you'll get quite a nice picture of variation within these populations. So, you know, I started off in this talk saying that variation is important and genetic markers can give you some handle on which populations are genetically variable and British populations are not genetically variable. So these, these um, indicators, A, R, H, O, and H, E, are all measures of genetic variation. So you can see what they are here. Again, I don't want to concern myself too much about that. But the point to note is that some of these populations are higher than other populations. So if you look at this population here, this clay pants population, you can see that it has a low genetic variation because all these numbers here are low compared to say the top population of gray drain. So this population is genetically not particularly variable. This population here is quite variable genetically. So 
This is very important information because we know that evolutionary potential depends on genetic variation, which we'll come back to in just a bit a while. If you look down the bottom here, you can also see a population that seems to be a little bit low compared to these other populations. This is this pig swamp population. And it has what we call a high FIS. Now, FIS is a measure of inbreeding in that population. So inbreeding can be estimated from genetic markers very simply. You compare the amount of homozygotes versus heterozygotes. And if a population is inbred, you're going to get more homozygotes compared to the heterozygotes. And this population here is clearly suffering from inbreeding based on these genetic markers. This is just a p-value measuring inbreeding and it's highly significant. So we can see immediately that these genetic markers give you an indication not only of how isolated the populations are, which ones are connected, which ones are not connected, which species might be occurring that are cryptically present, but also some indication of how variable these populations are genetically, which is very useful information moving forward. And of course, any potential issues with inbreeding in your population. So again, this is why you know, I say that this sort of genetic information is incredibly important as background when you think about translocation. So in our particular case, you know, we're interested in translocating the species to some new areas that were being created, some new wetlands. And immediately, of course, we could say, well, you've got to look at the species you've got present, because we now know there's two species. We've got this massive divergence genetically, but that's going to restrict what's available for translocation. You don't want to start putting one species into an area where the other species exists, but it's absent. We also now know that you know, there are patterns of connectivity amongst those populations. So in some cases, when you're interested in revegetating in a particular stream, and it's connected already, then you may not have to do very much. You may just be able to leave that and not do very much at all, because eventually it will be repopulated, or it will be, sorry, boosted by individuals from a nearby population. If there's no genetic distance, if genetic distance is zero between those populations, then eventually, you know, that population will make its way across and colonize that. And the last thing, as I mentioned, is that we have this variation, this genetic diversity measure, which indicates how, um, how, how good that population is in adaptation for the future. Very important quantity. And of course, inbreeding. You've got inbreeding problems, then potentially your population could collapse, and you need to know about those. So the reason why you need adaptation is because as the environment changes, it's going to need to adapt to that environment. But I started off saying that, you know, genetic variation is critical here. It's going to be as a consequence of plasticity, but also very much the amounts of genetic variation that you have present in the population. So individuals can adapt by evolution. You know, that's what creates biodiversity, of course, in the long run. And you want that process to keep going. You don't want that process to stop. So if you've got a population that has very little genetic variation, it's not going to be able to deal with the future. It's not going to be able to adapt. And, you know, there are textbooks full of examples of rapid adaptation to all sorts of stresses that are extremely well known and extremely well documented. Now, there's also a second point here is that, you know, when you're dealing with a species that has a wide geographic range, then it's likely that across that range, populations are going to be adapted differently to stresses that vary along that range. So for instance, if you have populations that occur in waterways that tend to dry up, then populations in the dry areas may well have different adaptations than ones in areas that never dry up. So this fish, for instance, in the West, is likely to be exposed to a much greater drying than populations in the east. And this fish has quite a unique ability to get into the mud and to change its physiology in dealing with drought conditions. So it can actually survive quite well under very dry conditions. But of course, the populations that are continually being dried out are going to be much better adapted than the populations that are not exposed to dry very often. So we expect to see, and this is you know, a general rule in these sorts of studies, that populations are differentiated and they are locally adapted to the conditions that occur. So not only has evolution got the potential to change those populations continuously, but of course it has already done so in the past. 
So it's very important when you do translocations to think about, you know, how is your local population adapted to particular conditions? And, you know, it's certainly the case that it will often be adapted to some extent. So the third point in that slide I've already mentioned, a few generations, you can actually get adaptation. And, you know, this is, and having variation is critical for that. And of course, introducing new genes into that population is also critical. So that connectivity that I was talking about is very critical for introducing new genes into your population. So when you think about population size and gene variation, there's a number of models out there that you can apply to understand how it occurs, but this is basically what it looks like. So if you what, you what you're trying to do is you're trying to get into the region here somewhere in terms of your population size because here your population is capable of maintaining lots and lots of variation so once you get to about a thousand individuals then you'll see that this line that connects variation genetic variation to population size starts to level off so that's what you're trying to do so here, what you're trying to do is you're trying to get to this region here in terms of moving forward. So it's, um, it's a situation where we're trying to actually get a good picture of how to move species from here to here. And this is, you know, this is pretty important in the long run because, you know, people say, well, I've got a population, I'm considering a population, and I've got 100 individuals in it. Well, you're here somewhere you're still going to lose genetic variation in that population. You're going to try and get to a thousand or more if you're going to have a good positive impact in that population. So we always encourage people to think about thousand rather than hundred and preferably a few thousand. And they of course might consist of interconnected populations, single populations, but from a genetic point of view, that's the space you want to get into if you want to conserve variation in the long run. So there's quite a lot of experimental data showing the importance of getting into that region um, based on experimental information. So I'll just give you a couple, but I mean, you can find lots in the literature. So this was work done on the shrimp species, you know, a very nice study that came out of the US. And what they did was they set up population with different levels of genetic variation. So these just indicate eight times the amount of variation as this one here. And this one has even more than eight times the variation. So they set up these shrimp populations and they watched them and they stressed them. And there's two bars here, and the first bar is a stressed population, and the second bar is a non-stressed population. So you've got variation running along this axis here, and along the y-axis, you've got extinction time. So what you want to do is, of course, get into this region here, where extinction time is going to be lengthened considerably in these populations. And the thing I want you to know is that when you've got no variation and stress in your system, you're down here somewhere. So when you've got low levels of variation, then that population goes extinct very, very quickly, purely as a consequence of the genetics. You know, this is not talking about different population sizes that start off with. These were identical population sizes. You're just varying the amount of gene variation and you go extinct. On the other hand, if you've got loss of gene variation, you're going to last a hell of a lot longer. So if you go to the right side, you can see that even under stressful conditions, these populations were surviving, you know, 80 generations before they were going extinct on average. So this really shows you the power of genetic variation in terms of actually being able to account for extinction risks. The more variation you've got, the less likely you are to go extinct. Here's a fly example, more recent example that was published this year. And this is based on SNP variations. This is a single nucleotide polymorphism. So these researchers scored somewhere between 10 and 40,000 SNPs across the genome. And that's all they did. They characterized genetic variation purely based on these SNPs. And what they then did was they actually then selected, they selected these populations for a particular stress. And they asked, can the SNP variation predict the response to selection across a number of generations before these populations become extinct or before they can't adapt? So one of the measures they had of adaptation was body size under stress. So the stress reduced the body size but you can see that very clearly as the SNP variation increases, then the adaptive capacity of these populations increase. So when you've got lots of variation, lots of SNP variation, then your body size becomes bigger and bigger and bigger. 
If you've got no variation, then of course you're heading for trouble. Those are just two examples of how important variation is for evolution. If you want to avoid extinction, if you want to adapt quickly, then you need variation in your populations. And also, variation is very simple to support. You can just go to your population, measure a bunch of SNPs, and you'll get some idea about the adaptive capacity. You may know nothing about the genes that actually underlie the adaptive response, but you can still get useful information on this plan. Now, of course, the other reason why we want variation is we want to avoid inbreeding issues you know, that are critically important. So this is a Hamilton honey eater. This is one, this is you know, an important bird in Victoria. And this particular population of healthy honey eater um, is in trouble because of inbreeding effects. And you can estimate the inbreeding effects again with these SNP markers very, very accurately. And I gave you an example on the fish where you looked at this FIS, which gives you an indication of the amount of inbreeding. And that's related to the level of homozygosity versus heterozygosity. Inbreeding causes homozygosity. So the more alleles that are homozygous, the greater the inbreeding. So in this particular case, so these data were published recently by a group here. And what you're doing is you're increasing the homozygosity. And what you're looking at is the number of bird, a bird offspring, number of fledgling that are produced as a consequence of having a particular level of homozygosity, a particular level of inbreeding. And the thing to note is like that evolutionary potential that I just showed you, the effects are absolutely dramatic. So this is fuel data, by the way. So fuel data on these birds indicate that if you've got a lot of homozygosity, a lot of inbreeding, you're producing only a very small number of fledglings. On the other hand, if you're basically not inbred or have low levels of inbreeding, then you're up here somewhere. So that's a five-fold difference in the amount of offspring you're producing as a consequence of inbreeding. So if you've got your health and honey eater population or your amphibian population, and it's subject from these sorts of issues, it's inbred, you know, you're going to potentially reduce that particular offspring production by um, 80% or even 90% in some cases. You know, that's a dramatic effect that you need to think about. So genetics can give you a handle on that. Very simple to do. Use your SNPs and make sure that your populations are outbred that you're going to translocate. So, this slide is a little bit more complicated, but you know, this is a paper that we published in TREE a couple of years ago. This is really on genetic variation, and it's really asking the question, you know, why is genetic variation so important? You know, why is it important to actually get these populations up? And you know, what I'm just going to do is just allude to the fact that there are a number of different processes involved in this whole this whole this whole issue. So, you know, so what you can do is you can get what's called linkages of equilibrium. So these are blocks of genes that can be linked to bad genes. And the genetic variation in your population can, can get rid of that LD. It can break down the pattern of LD. So you've obviously got a whole lot of interactions with deleterious genes, such as in this Halberton honey eater example that I just mentioned. But you've got a whole lot of different processes that feed into this. Genetically, it's quite a complicated effect, this whole population size issue. And you know, I'd suggest that you read that paper if you're interested in looking at some of these issues that are involved here. But genetically, it's quite a complicated process. It's partly inbreeding, it's partly the amount of linkage you're getting between genes, it's partly the connection between deleterious effects and um, and these and these other the rest of the genome that you need to break up. And there's other processes involved as well, including mutational meltdown. All right, so back to translocation. So the question then becomes, well, you know, what do we do? Which, which population are we going to select? And when people think about conserving species, the emphasis in the last 30 years or so has been on, uh, on um, the genetically unique species. Populations are worth something. So in other words, if you have a particular species you're interested in, and you characterize them genetically, and you find that you know they're different genetically, then you might be tempted to immediately say, well, what I'm going to do is make sure that I can serve the populations that are genetically the most unique. In other words, they have the biggest genetic distance between them. So that's been the trend in the last 30 years or so. 
So, for instance, the conservation value of a particular population previously has been determined very much by the genetic distance to other populations. If you've got a big genetic distance, then people are thought, oh, that's critically important. Now, it turns out that there's a problem with that approach that's been recognized quite recently. So here we have a situation where we have genetic uniqueness. So here we have a whole lot of populations and they're plotted in the space between how genetically unique they are compared to all other populations and the amount of genetic variation along the x-axis that they carry. So we know that this is important for adaptation, for avoiding inbreeding, but this tells you how unique these populations are um, in the environment that you're dealing with, in the area you're dealing with. So here we have a population that is incredibly unique. So it's genetically quite isolated from other populations, but it also has the problem in that it doesn't have much genetic variation. So from, a, from the point of view of dealing with future environmental change, this population is not going to do very well, but it is genetically quite a unique population. So you get this negative relationship, it's never quite linear, but you get this negative relationship between these two variables that you need to think about. And you know, there's no easy answer to this, but certainly if you're conserving a species, if you're thinking about a species that's going to persist into the future, then you want populations that are out here somewhere. But if you do have something unique going on, you might also try and pick one of these two or two of these two as well. So the triage situation is not easily dealt with, but it's worth thinking about. And certainly you make sure that at least you're conserving something along here. So that's the problem we face, and it's an issue that we need to look at. And there are some guidelines that are being developed to look at that sort of issue. But this is going to show you that uh, in Australian mammals, um, we have the situation developing. So we can, so this is a mountain pygmy possum, Baramus parvus, and the red dots are where the populations are currently landing. The blue dots are simulated, don't worry about that too much, but you can see that the red dots pretty much fall along this line. And other Australian mammals also fall along this line quite well. And this indicates that a lot of this divergence is being driven by what we call genetic drift, by random processes, which from an evolutionary point of view are probably not that important. So this gives us justification for focusing on these mountain pygmy possums that are out here somewhere in terms of genetic variation. So again, you know, I urge you to have a look at this paper here if you're interested in this sort of issue, but it's one you're going to come across when you collect genetic data, and it's one that you need to think about quite carefully. All right, so let's move on and consider a translocation. Let's get to a translocation. You're sick of me talking about genetics. What about the real world? So what I'm going to do is talk about an example and illustrate the sort of issues involved. So this is mountain pygmy possum, just replaced that with your favorite amphibian. And in this particular case, this is a possum that occurs in the high country in my part of the world, and it occurs in three regions. This is the Kosciuszko region, this is what we call the Mount Hoffman um, Nels region, and this is around False Creek, and this is an area called Mount Buller. It has three areas where this possum occurs. It's considered to be a pretty threatened species. There are only a few thousand of these guys left, um, and they have certainly decreased in recent times. So again, we can do one of these genetic studies and you know, you look at this and you say, aha, well, let's look at this top population of Mount Buller. It's got much lower genetic variation. Now to get this is genetic variation compared to these other populations here. It also has a high FIS. So it's got inbreeding issues, highly significant, and it's got low variation with these other populations. So that's our background genetic data, in this case, from like sort of microsatellites, but currently you're probably collecting with SNPs. Now, the other thing about this population is that it was first noticed that when you temporarily sample these microsatellites, then we've seen changes in that level of genetic variation occurring in that Buller population. So here's a population away from Buller, here's the Buller population, and you can see it's crashing pretty quickly genetically. And it's losing variation, it's losing variation very, very quickly, just over a few years, you know, seven years, you've gone from having allelic richness, which is one measure of variation of near five to about two. So that says that you've lost more than half your variation over just a few years in the species. 
that a species is genetically in trouble. And it's in trouble basically because it occurs in this region marked by this here. And what was happening was that there were basically snow, so this is a snow field, this is a skiing area. So here's our skiing village. And skiing runs were being produced um, in this area that was inhabited by this particular species. And if you're skiing down a slope, then what you don't want to do is hit a rock field. But the rock fields, of course, turn out to be where the species hibernates in winter. So bulldozers were going through these rock fields, clearing them for the ski runs, but of course destroying the habitat of this particular species. So what you've got is a crash in populations, a crash in genetic variation, and of course this population is going to go extinct somewhere in the next 10 or 20 years. So what do you do? Well, you translocate. So, so we thought about this very carefully and a number of options were considered, which included captive breeding, um, and which also included translocation. So of course you could just take these population, this population here and captive breed and then re-release it, but that wouldn't solve the problem because it's already low genetically, so that wasn't an option. So what we decided to do was to actually do a translocation from this population here to this population here to try and boost this genetic variation. And at the same time, dealing with the situation where ecological reconstruction had to happen. So ecologically, the boulder fields were recreated. So we had habitat back in that area. And genetically, we timed these populations as having split 10,000 years ago. So the question was, you know, is that too long? You know, are these genotypes too unique? Is there going to be incompatibility occurring in these populations? So in this case, there were six males that were introduced in this population. You know, you, you can actually introduce quite small numbers to get um, a genetic boost, if you like. And we were able to get this measure of genetic variation, heterozygosity, up from 0.14 to 0.39. So we more than doubled it. So we're pretty happy about that. So these individuals went in, they started breeding with the local population. And, you know, we are now at about five or six generations down the track. So it's all good. But immediately what also started happening is that the population started going up. So the population crashed dramatically. We only had a few individuals left. We pumped into genetics and we also did some ecological restoration. The restoration started getting enough, but the genetics really boosted it. And in fact, this population has never been larger than what it was in 2015 after we started this, these genetic reintroductions. So that's the sort of success you can get out of reintroduction. And of course, we then, you know, genetically we could track the animals, we took hair samples of the animals, we can actually track them. And, you know, and we've got these hybrids. We can actually measure the fitness of the hybrid versus the non-hybrids. And you can see that the hybrids have a higher fitness than the non-hybrids. And initially, this difference is massive, right? 2.6 times. Later on, as the genes start mixing in this population, you've still got a few non-hybrids left, but, you know, the advantage seems to go down somewhat. But still, we have a massive boost of the population size. The population is now big, and it seems to have recovered very well. And, you know, and it turns out that this inbred population really was suffering from having small individuals. So by generating this genetic variation, introducing these individuals, we could show that the hybrids, these hybrids here indicated in blue, were larger than the non-hybrids. So inbreeding tends to decrease body size if it's severe enough. We've reintroduced genetic variation, we've got the outbreeding happening, and we've shown fitness effects that account for the fact that we have such a nice increase in the population size of that particular species. So that's one of the big success stories in genetic translocation. And you know, this is just to show you that the genes are continually mixing. We now have an admixture from a range of different levels happening in the population. So we've gone from a situation where basically it seems to have stabilized at around 50% local genes, 50% genes from the introduction, and you've got a new genetic constitution that population that seems to hope that seems to be quite stable and hopefully quite resilient into the future. And of course, we've boosted the adaptive potential of this population massively. So translocations return genetic variation to the original levels. Not quite there, but certainly very close. We only 
translocated a few individuals, and we basically use populations at high levels in the first place. And you know, we repeated this across a couple of years. Now it's important to know that you know you don't want you don't want your genetic distances be to, to be too big when you're doing these translocations because you can get some outbreaking depression. All right, so let's keep moving because I realise I'm taking far too long. So we're doing this um, for other species as well. So this is bandicoots we're working with currently, and this is a translocation that is even more um, radical in a way because what we're doing is translocating across states. So these ones are separated by more than 15,000 years, and they're actually considered to be subspecies. So the question is, can we get this bandicoot back up? In Victoria, the bandicoots are highly inbred, they're in trouble, they're not doing very much, they can only exist in areas where basically there are fences to keep predators out. In Tasmania, they still occur in the wild, and we're trying to ask the question, can we get these guys back up by crossing with these ones here? So we've got a whole lot of pens that have been set up and these crosses are happening. And there's our first F1. So we know we can get F1s based on these pens. So we do that experimentally first. And we have just released our first ones in the wild where they are, of course, exposed to natural conditions and you get predation. So you'll see a bird come down, oh, escape that one. But this is what happens in the wild, right? So the real situation in the wild is that they're exposed to predators and we can track them. And these are still areas that are um, fenced off. There's no predators involved apart from these birds, but they seem to be doing remarkably well. And you know, we are currently, um, as of last week, up to the F3 stage in these particular animals, and they seem to be nice and fit, nice and big, and are going to be really capable of boosting natural populations. So, and these sorts of, there's also situations where you shouldn't translocate. And genetically, there are two issues. So one is reproductive incompatibility and the other one is loss of adaptation. So, so when you translocate, you've got to think about, you know, is the population that I'm using to source individuals for a translocation genetically adapted to different conditions? Because if it is, then you may not want to put them in that spot. You might want to try and match, if you can, the animals that you translocate. So from a genetic point of view, they're adapted to the same sorts of conditions. You can also get incompatibility, and that's where you cross two organisms, and you know, all of a sudden the reproduction fails. So if things are separated too much, then basically you could get an incompatibility occurring in the F1s or the F2s that affects the fitness of those organisms. So you've always got to watch out for that. But you know, there are ways of minimizing those sorts of things. We can look at genetic distance, and if the distance is small enough, then you're usually okay. But again, it reiterates the value of genetic data, background genetic data. So Dick Frankton and others have suggested some guidelines around this, which is that if two populations are chromosomally different in terms of the number of chromosomes they have, or whether there's big inversions present or translocations, these are genetic translocations, then you shouldn't use those because you may get some reproductive incompatibility. That's probably too conservative of an approach because it really depends on the clade you're looking at. You know, in some cases, you've got populations that have different chromosome numbers and they cross fine. So it's a guideline, but it's a very, very rough guideline. And what you really need to do is to think about the organism that you're working with. So this is an example of an inversion that you can get, and you can score it to some flies, but these sorts of things can basically occur. So here's a chromosome, and you can see that basically this region here is inverted when you compare this individual here to this individual here. So that's just to show what I, what I mean when I talk about an inversion. So you can look for those of the big enough to may give you incompatibility, but it's not an question. And these are examples, one a grasshopper, one a kangaroo, where you have big inversions present, and chromosome count differences present. So this is uh, these two these two races of this grasshopper. One has 17, one has 15, and they cross fine. So these wallabies and these grasshoppers can cross despite the fact that chromosome they're quite different. So just reiterating that point, it's a very rough guideline. It's probably too conservative in many cases. All right. So just in the last couple of minutes, because I'm going to allow some time for questions if people want to ask things. Um, you know, 
it's important to identify source populations when you want to do things like climate matching, when you want to do, when you want to source things that are similar from an evolutionary point of view, it's very important to sort those things. And this is work that's been done a lot in plants. It should be done in animals, but it's very rarely done in animals. If you think about translocation, look to see how well your source population for your translocation has adapted to their environments and how well it matches the environment that you're translocating into. Very important, plant people do this all the time. For animals, we, some, we often just don't consider this at all. And of course, you know, um, there's lots of data in plants indicating that translocations are critical for matching because otherwise you'll get a lot of tree death. And you know, I won't spend any time on this because it's pretty obvious in the left that you've got a lot of tree death going on. If you do it wrong, you potentially are going to get death. But the problem is that, of course, we are now living in a world where things are changing very quickly. So in plants, people are talking about not matching death for the current, but also matching for the future. So, so when you do revegetation, then maybe it's important to introduce genotypes that are going to be suitable into the future as well as for the current time. So when you do translocations, maybe you need to be introducing genotypes from a climate, for instance, that matches the climate that you expect in a place in 2050, not just at the present. And you know that's a very contentious issue, but things are changing in the plant world with the guidelines around revegetation are starting to shift a number of countries to try and promote that sort of thing. So, you know, I was going to give you an example of that, but I'll skip over that. Um, and that's in some trees. But I just want to summarize the main points that hopefully I've got across here. So, if you're doing translocations, please check to see what the genetic data look like. You know, make sure you collect your genetic data across your species range, ideally, but certainly in your target area it's going to give you an awful lot of interesting information. Genetic translocations are an important consideration because you can boost the adaptive potential of your populations in the future. You can get rid of inbreeding effects quite effectively and certainly in situations where they've been applied, such as in that mountain baby possum, they can have a huge impact on your population size. They can boost immediate fitness very effectively but importantly are also going to be critically important for the future. Now, hybridization of populations is an issue that I've mentioned. You know, in the eastern Bar Bandicoots, we're going up 15,000 years. You can probably go out much further than that. And some people are starting to say, well, you know, maybe we need to go out much more than that and hybridize species, not just subspecies, but also species. But, you know, when you do that, of course, you do have to concern you have to have concerns about genetic incompatibility and other things that I've mentioned. And also, of course, you can also potentially transfer diseases, which are now critically important from an amphibian point of view. So you have to be careful. You've got to do it very carefully. But genetics gives you a good handle on what's going on. All right, so I might stop there. I've talked for, I think, close to an hour. Um, but I'm willing to obviously entertain questions if there is time available still, really. Yeah, thank you, Eric. And uh, I think this is a uh, really good talk. Uh, even using other species mod as a model, uh, it, it illustrates what different scenarios people deal with when when working with a, a captive assurance population. So, so in the captive setting, what what are you bringing in, and uh, and what you are putting out there? Also understanding what is the effect of the species of the, of the genetic of the animals you are putting back into the wild. So, if there is uh, questions uh, for Ari, uh, again, either raise your hand and use the mic, or use the Q and A box or the chat box. Uh, have I, um, yeah. Okay, I'm doing this right. Oh, okay, sorry, so I forgot. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, I was just clicking the wrong one. So I, think I can see yours. 
question now. Do you recommend trying to test crosses in the lab before introduction? Or do you think selection will eliminate any issues of outbreeding? But that's a really good question. Um, but that's a, yeah, hang on a sec. Sorry, that's a really good question. I'm hope, I hope you're hearing this. Sorry, I may have clicked the wrong button, but I'm assuming this is working okay. So, so the answer to that is that if you can test it first, it's good but it's not essential. So I would say that, you know, I would say that if you have, if you have the ability to test in the lab before you start, that's worth doing. But if you find that our breeding is not particularly strong, you know, it might be weak, it might be in order of 10 or 20%, then I agree with you that selection will take care of it. The selection is very effective, of course, in removing any deleterious combinations of genes that occur. You know, if you've got a couple of populations and there is a small genetic distance between them, then basically um, your outbreeding depression is probably not going to occur. I wouldn't worry too much about it, um, but it is a situation that is worth tracking. So don't feel like you have to do crosses in the labs before you start. If the genetic distance is small, if it's larger, it might be worth doing that. Um, but certainly in the order of 10 or 20 percent outbreak depression, I suspect that natural selection will remove it quite effectively. <laughs> All right, great. Now I think I had another question pop up. Um, what was the other? There was another question. I think I saw it pop up. I'm just going to find it. It was a couple of comments from Laura. Yeah, I mean, I saw one about public. There was one that came up about the public um, opposition. Oh, yeah, if you go to if you go to chats, go to chat, right? And there's one. Oh, yeah. I've got there. Yeah, now I can see it. Yeah, it's from Sarah. Right, opposition to translocation new genotypes. <laughs> Good question. <laughs> I agree entirely that some people are very focused on preserving the unique genotypes. So the question is, was there opposition to translocating new genotypes in the examples you use? Some people are very focused on preserving unique genotypes. I agree entirely. And that's a massive issue. Um, so the whole notion that genetic variation is important, and you may have to focus on that at the cost of uniqueness, genetic uniqueness, is controversial. Um, but it's important because you end up spending all your conservation efforts conserving small fragments that are not that important for future survival of a species. So that's a point that's worth getting across and it takes, you know, it takes some effort. So the mountain pygmy possum, um, yes, of course, some people said, well, you know, the bullet population is unique um, and we shouldn't hybridize that with any other population. But, you know, the recovery team realized that the models were stating that if we don't do anything, this population is going to go extinct. So in that particular case, we were in a situation where we could say, if we don't do anything, then the whole thing will collapse. And, you know, that's a very powerful argument. So in that particular case, we had models that showed that unless the fitness of the population could increase, the population would disappear. We had some opposition from the zoo that was quite strong because the zoo wanted to bring those individuals in and captively breed them and then try and re-release them when supposedly conditions became better or something along those lines. Now, you know, zoos are incredibly important. They can take a, can play a major role in translocations, but, you know, but the genetic data eventually convinced them that it was also the way to go. So I think models can help. I think um, data such as we had showing a population crash can help. I think data showing inbreeding can help. So, you know, the background information was used very effectively to argue in this particular case for a re-release. The Eastern Mark Bandicoot example is more challenging. The um, situation there, of course, is that you are crossing state boundaries. So we initially had to convince the Tasmanians to give us some animals, and it was okay to actually um, introduce some animals to Victoria to try and resurrect Victorian population. But again, you know, there was evidence, accumulating evidence, that the Eastern Mar Bandicoots in Victoria were um, 
suffering from inbreeding. Again, we had the background genetic data that was done. You know, we had SNP data as well as microsatellite data showing that problem. And, and of course, you know, the reintroductions of that species um, had not gone well in the past. So again, you know, it's a question of slowly working with the recovery team, explaining things and going through a process where the recovery team becomes supportive. So it's a process. It's, it takes a lot of efforts. I mean, Andrew Wicks, who spent a lot of time with the Mouse and Pygmy Possum recovery team, took a long time to convince them, but eventually you get there. But you need to collect your background data. You know, your background data is what's key here. But what we, the last thing we want to do, of course, is to spend all our conservation dollars, which are always extremely limited, in conserving species that are genetically unique, but they have no chance of adapting into the future. You know, we are facing critical times. We're facing high extinction rates and genetic variation plays a major role in ensuring that at least some populations of species can survive. Okay, is there anything else? I'm just trying to look again. It seems there is no more questions here so uh -huh. far. Uh, thank you again, Eric, for your time and your sharing your experience and your expertise this topic. All right, no problem, Louise. I'll um, get on with the rest of my day then. Good luck with the, um, the rest of the symposium. Thank you. And for the participants, I'll just remind you tomorrow we will start at 9 um, US Central Time. And I'll see you or hear you tomorrow.